Hello everyone, we're Consultants for Sustainability, and we'd like to take a moment to thank everyone in this room for allowing us to come back to the Executive Technology Summit. Sitting in this room are some of the top executives from massive technology companies such as Google, Microsoft, Meta, Amazon, and many more. So what are we here to talk about today? Well, we're here to talk about artificial intelligence, AI. It's no secret that AI is everywhere. Every news article, every online journal, every TikTok has something about AI. But what is AI? Well, to put it simply, AI is a digital solution. A digital solution designed to simulate human decision making. That's pretty cool, right? But unfortunately, there's a massive problem with AI. That problem being AI bias. But what is AI bias? When there's an issue with your training data, in other words, the data used to train or simulate your AI to make those human, those human decisions, when there's an issue in that data, well, AI bias occurs. And when AI bias pops up, those predictions made by your AI can have adverse effects. But what causes AI? AI bias. AI bias is caused by issues within your training data. Primarily, two big issues. The first major issue is when your training data contains a list of inaccuracies. Obviously, when your AI is fed inaccurate data, your AI will be trained, well, to make inaccurate decisions. The second biggest problem with training data, when your training data contains biases, whether implicit or not implicit. When your training data contains biases, your AI has been primed to make, well, discriminatory decisions. So what's the bottom line ethical dilemma we're here to talk about? Well, if your AI is biased, is, if AI bias is present in your algorithm, well, that will propagate existing social issues. Things like racial discrimination, gender discrimination, income inequality, will all be propagated, enhanced by, well, your AI. Hence why we developed our four-part AI bias mitigation framework designed to tackle AI bias. Part number one of our framework includes setting a list of standards for your AI for your development process to follow. That first standard being, well, having a diverse team. If you want to really embrace the ideas of diversity and inclusion, your staff, your machine learning team, your business administration needs to be reflective of the diversity of your end users. Speaking of end users, well, we need to involve our end users. Your end users can give you feedback from a wide range of perspectives that can really embrace diversity and inclusion. By getting that feedback and learning from it within your development process, you can take a step forward to being a more inclusive firm. Our third requirement, being transparent. Data transparency, privacy laws, this is a whole another topic. We believe that it is ethical to be transparent with your data. Back to our framework. Our second part of our framework mandates that every single company utilizing an AI tool conduct some sort of third party bias audit. What is a bias audit? A bias audit takes your AI, it takes your algorithm, and it determines, well, is your AI discriminatory or not? But how do we determine that, right? Is that an easy thing to determine? Well, we made it easy. In our third step of our framework, we include a selection rate and impact ratio calculation. These numbers are essential in determining, well, whether your AI is discriminatory or not. So what if your AI is discriminatory? Well, we have something called a reassessment period, the fourth part of our framework. This re reassessment period entails a list of steps to follow and what to do for the future to determine how you can make your AI, well, not be adverse. Now I'll hand it off to Joe to talk about some of the further harms of AI bias. Thanks, Nabil. So we've discussed what AI bias is. We've discussed how your company can take steps to mitigate the risk of AI bias within your models. But let's take a look at some real world examples of models that had bias present when they were applied. First, Optum Healthcare. Optum Healthcare developed a risk score for their business practices. Unfortunately, there was bias present within this model. This model stipulated that black patients needed to be sicker than their white counterparts to receive the same amount of care. Then there's Amazon, a familiar face within this field. Amazon utilized an AI tool to screen out resumes in the hiring process. Unfortunately, this model was shown to have a heavy bias towards men. Your company simply cannot afford to enforce the gender discrimination bias that exists within the tech field. When women make up only 18% of the tech field, you can't make this matter worse. So why else should your company care about acknowledging AI bias? Well, our team recognized that there are values it, uh, integral to the tech industry, such as respecting users, accountability, being impact-driven, and always thinking about the long-term ramifications of everything you're doing. Our solution adheres to these values. 
and helps your company achieve the long-term goals that you need to achieve. Our, our, our team also believes that this solution will help the world achieve its collective goals. The United Nations outlined their sustainable development goals, and our framework specifically targets SDG 10, which is to reduce inequality within and among countries. Let's take a look at how this concretely applies with a real-world example. As mentioned earlier, in the hiring process, there are inherent biases within the human decision-making process, such as gender discrimination and racial discrimination. The use of an AI model provides a massive opportunity for your company and society as at large. However, the use of an AI model that contains bias can only serve to make these matters worse. If your AI model, can, if your AI model utilizes our framework and all but eliminates bias, this model can make better decisions that are more impartial than any human or group of humans can ever dream of making. This specifically targets the UN framework because it encourages income growth of low-income communities and protects and ensures social protection of marginalized communities. We want everyone in this room to take a moment with us to visualize this scenario. You're a young college graduate. You have dreams of establishing yourself as a young professional within the field of investment banking. You take time, day, day, day in and day out, to build your resume, to build your experience, to hopefully one day break into this competitive industry. You apply to countless companies. Time in and time again, you don't receive any good news. Rejection after rejection. You're sad, disappointed, discouraged. You ask yourself, what did I do wrong? What you didn't know is that isn't the right question you should be asking. Every single one of those companies utilize an AI, a biased AI. And as a member of a marginalized community, you are a victim of AI bias. Unfortunately, this scenario that we just visualized isn't even one that you need to imagine. That's right. Workday was hit with the first ever AI discrimination lawsuit. What Workday was doing was utilizing an AI tool within the hiring process. This AI tool led to uh, women being in marginalized groups being uh, inadvertently biased and uh, screening out their applications before humans could even come across their application. Now the ethical, the, the legal and financial implications of this issue are massive. However, our team knows that the ethical implications are even more dire. We want to establish that it is vital to acknowledge AI bias. To not acknowledge AI bias, to not embrace our four-part framework, means that you are propagating, enhancing all of these social biases that we've been talking about gender discrimination, racial discrimination. Issues like these will be enhanced within your workforce if you do not address AI bias. So what does that mean for us? You have an opportunity here as leaders within the technology industry to stand at the forefront of confronting AI bias. By adopting our framework, you can truly be a leader against this critical issue. It'll reduce inequalities and overall have a better impact maximize the overall good the gross stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Well done. Next we have uh, Cleveland Consulting. Good morning. So whenever you're ready, I'll start the clock, so just let me know when you're ready to go. All right. Good. Go. Thank you again to the Board of Directors of the International Association for Jesuit Universities. We are here today to discuss ethical issues regarding our presentation a few weeks ago on inspiring morally courageous leaders with the integrated justice model and measuring that. Before we begin, I am Megan. I'm Christopher. And I'm Olivia. Imagine this. You just took your first ever business ethics course at your Jesuit University. You love the content, they directly align with your values, and they directly align with the Jesuit values. Come next semester, you are in your corporate internship, and you're excited to see what's next. You come across a few ethical dilemmas in this internship, and you think back to this business ethics course you took. You think, okay, all this content's here, I know all this, but what's the first step? How do I apply this to the decision that I'm going to make today? Well, the integrated justice model can help you make that first step. The problem we're trying to solve here is ensuring that universities and business decision and decision makers are on the same page. This requires to address a few issues. 
The first one is incongruencies between practices and integrity, a lack of a shared framework, as well as an absence in a marketing strategy. Students need a ethical normative framework to have something to rely on when they're making these business decisions in the future. Jesuit universities are well respected, seemingly ethical institutions, but we have 17 sustainable development goals and no framework to apply them. The SDGs are important guidelines that all businesses and organizations should follow and actively work towards achieving. The problem is that within the Jesuit network, there is no normative framework or common guide to assess ethical business decisions. Father Nicky Santos is an accountant turned Jesuit. He is the original author of the Integrative Justice Model, or commonly known as the IJM. As a Jesuit, Father Santos earned his PhD in accounting because he wanted to focus on the international, the interactions between business and society. He has worked on the IJM as well established within the marketing literature, such as the Journal of Business Ethics. Father Santos is a reminder to all Jesuits that when there is a problem, we take action against it. We will promote different things within the Jesuit network and make sure we are combating different inequalities within it. We propose this normative ethical framework can serve as a guide for the ethical decision making that underlies sustainable development. As someone who attended a Jesuit and Catholic grade school and high school, something that was very important to me was my passion for my education as well as my faith. So when I was choosing the college, I wanted something that was centered around the values of the Jesuits. Throughout my time in high school and college, I was fortunate enough to have teachers who emphasized the importance of decision making while encouraging Ethical, dis ethical decision making to impact and how it would impact the world around us. This was a formative experience for me and shaped the understanding of what it means to be a responsible and ethical member of society. Some students in surrounding schools that I grew up with were not as fortunate enough to have the same mindset and experience about social responsibility and ethics. When I got to college, I was shocked at how many students were surprised that we had to take courses in philosophy, um, issues in social justice, and theology. For me, this was normal. This was how my ethical mindset was formed. With that being said, my roommates and I, who are all different majors, usually discussed our classes and how different the values are interpreted. In my business classes, I learn business perspectives, but with the IJM, I feel more prepared in going into the real world because they, I have concrete things to consider when I'm making a business decision. So, questions such as, am I being trustworthy and is my engagement authentic? Am I co-creating value with consumers to my products and services? Am I meeting the wants and the needs of the consumers? And how will my decision affect others in the supply chain? We need a framework to inspire leaders to implement sustainable development practices. The issue with, this is an issue because sustainable development involves ensuring that we are um, in the long-term profit management realm rather than the short-term profit maximization turnaround, um, which is what we typically talk. Without a shared framework, ethical practices um, will help, will ultimately lead business decision makers to keep making decisions that are hurting impoverished communities without thinking of how it's hurting their economy or how it's hurting their health and well-being. Another thing that's important to notice here is that there are some organizations that have a disconnect between what they state their values are and what their actual practices are. And this is unethical because organizations have a social responsibility to integrate and be and have um, integrity and be transparent with their consumers as well as their stakeholders. Without aligning with the values you are stating, it's um, ultimately going to affect your relationship with the stakeholders as well as your consumers. There's the issue of ethical preparedness. We noted that students may be learning about ethics, but they may not understand what it is and how to apply it within the workplace. This is an issue because ethical decision making is critical in all industries and students need to be able to apply it when they graduate college. If students are not adequately prepared, they may be more likely to make unethical decisions or to overlook ethical considerations in their work. A Jesuit-educated business professional committing another Enron case is something that we do not want to happen. The presentation highlighted the IJM as a framework for promoting social justice as well. Social justice is an ethical issue because it involves promoting cure personalis or care for the whole person, 
and this idea of magis, or more, doing more. Without a focus on social justice, there is a risk that businesses will overlook inequalities and continue to the social injustice. So to solve many ethical issues, the IAJU can implement the IJM into the International Association of Jesuit Business Schools curriculum and recommend universities to teach this well in their classes. The IAJU is not telling Jesuit universities exactly what to teach, but instead telling them to phrase certain classes in ways to promote ethics and ethical decision making. The IAJU should implement the IJM coursework that's available on the United Global website into the Jesuit business core to form ethical decisions and ultimately align with the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. This is already done. Ignited Global has modules, articles, and even fully developed online courses per, for professors to utilize and ed, educate themselves as well as their students on the IJM. Utilizing Ignited Global is key for Jesuit universities to start teaching and implementing the IJM into solving ethical problems. Referring back to the data we collected, the most significant predictor was, to, was that Jesuit universities are um, helping students feel prepared to make to use the tools and make ethical business decisions. This accounted for 51% of the total variance, which is um, a predictor of being prepared to make ethical decisions and the perception of um, your career down the road. Jesuit schools around the world can provide the integrated justice model framework into their curriculums, which will allow students to have um, a first step basis when they're in, when they're making their business ethical business decisions, and ultimately solving the problem of not having um, a normative framework. To ensure that the IJM sticks with students, the IJU should offer a diploma-like certification. The leader would have this in their office, hanging above their wall, after completion of the course, reminding them always of an ethical mindset, reminding them always of the IJM. The intent to apply Jesuit tools learned in the post-graduating life is a significant predictor of one's perception of being prepared to make ethical decisions, or ethical preparedness. The solution and recommendation will be a constant reminder of the ethical framework and so does the decision making. So how does the, this exactly impact the IGU? By teaching the IJM to students and graduating them with a normative framework, post-graduation they will become ethical leaders in their industries. In turn, they could share their wealth at their universities, becoming donors. Allowing them, it will take ethical business leaders to achieve sustainable development in our time. And with that, we'd like to thank you for your time and please talk to us with any questions. The next team is the Mountain Ridge Consultant. Consultant. Good morning. Good morning. Let me know when you're ready and uh, I'll start the clock. We're ready. Ready? Go. Thank you so much, UPS Board Directors for having us back. Just to reintroduce ourselves, we are Mountain Ridge Consulting. My name is Liam Wall, Jacob Russett, Marcus Luceski. We're going to start with a story about a UPS driver. Last July, Esteban Chavez was celebrating his 24th birthday um, right in our back door in Pasadena, California. It was on a Friday, a uh, big barbecue, friends and family around. And Esteban had work the next day, but it didn't really damper the mood because Esteban really loved his job as a UPS driver. He loved the ability to be able to provide for his family. And so the next day, beautiful California day, 95 and sunny, as you and I were probably getting ready to go to the beach, Esteban was already underway on his 10-hour shift delivering packages across Pasadena. Now, these trucks on a hot day, they're more like greenhouses. They just heat up and heat up and retain that heat. When it's 95 out, that cab area where Esteban is driving, that's 110. And the cargo area in the back with the packages, that's 130. Now, by the early afternoon, Esteban had already done 
70 stops, hundreds of packages, and gone 70 times into that sauna-like environment in the back to sort, find, organize, and lift these packages. When he got to that next stop, he'd been sweating all day, but his body had failed at keeping his internal temperature below 104. His sweating had turned into goosebumps. He was dizzy, nauseous, couldn't think straight. He went into the back. It used to be 130. It's now 150. He goes in. He's looking around. He can't think straight. He can't find the package that he needs to deliver. Eventually, he just grabs a package, any package, just to get out of there. Go, deliver it to the door, come back to the truck. He sits down, and his body just gives out. He passes out in his seat falls over. When you pass out from heat stroke, every single minute matters. Your body can't control the temperature anymore. Your organs are swelling up and starting to fail. Esteban lied on the ground of his UPS truck for 20 minutes before anybody noticed anything. By the time First responders were able to get there. It was too late. He passed away. Unfortunately, the story of Esteban is not an isolated incident. Over a four year period, over a hundred UPS drivers will be hospitalized with heat related injuries. Just the summer before, Jose Rodriguez in Waco, Texas, had passed away also from a heat-related incident. To put it simply, a UPS employee dying of a preventable cause from the environment they're working in cannot simply be viewed as a cost of doing business. We need to do something about it, and now I'm gonna pass it over to Marcus, who's gonna further explain the ethical implications of this issue. Thank you, Liam. In UPS's mission statement, UPS outlines their corporate strategy, which consists of three main values which guide the company. These three values are being customer first, people led, and innovation driven. To UPS, being people led has to do with the employee experience. And a key part of the employee experience has to do with UPS ensuring the health well-being, and safety of its employees. This is reflected in the UPS Code of Conduct, which states that UPS is committed to protecting the health, well-being, and safety of its employees. In the UPS Corporate Social Responsibility Report from 2021, UPS states that they will do everything in their power to realize the full potential of each UPS employee. Part of realizing the full potential of each UPS employee has to do with UPS ensuring their right to a safe working environment. This right to safety is derived from the right to life. Familiarly, the right to life is in the United States Declaration of Independence in the preamble, which states that people have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The right to life means that you as an individual do not have Somebody is not allowed to infringe on your own bodily autonomy. The United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights from 1948 in Article 23, Section 1 states that all workers have the right to just and favorable working conditions. In the UPS Human Rights Statement recently updated in 2021, UPS says that they align themselves with this United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights and they state that they will ensure all employees the right to a safe working environment and that their health and well-being will be taken care of by UPS. We know that UPS cares about their values and is upholding them. That's why in 1951 UPS created the UPS Foundation which, through its many philanthropic efforts in sustainability, as well as providing for hurricane relief, flood relief, tornado relief, UPS 
the UPS Foundation will get water to those in need after tornadoes within 24 hours. Through their various philanthropic programs, the UPS Foundation is currently advancing 11 out of the 17 sustainable development goals. Jacob? As Liam and Marcus explained, UPS is facing a clear ethical issue. In order to address this, it is essential that the company installs AC units in delivery trucks to ensure a safe working environment and to limit heat exposure for drivers. This is an opportunity for the company to be more in line with its own existing ethical values of being a people-led organization and improving the employee experience. It is an opportunity for the company to be more in line with the UN <coughs> Universal Declaration of Human Rights and to incorporate the UN Sustainable Development Goals within their business operations. Specifically, goal number eight of decent work and target 8.8 .8 to protect labor rights and ensure secure and safe working environments for all workers. UPS invests an immense amount of time, effort, and money in ensuring that the trucks do not break down. It is time that the company ensures that the body of their drivers do not break down while in these trucks. And to do this, the company must install AC units to ensure a safe working environment and limit heat exposure. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Did the other team come in uh, that we, we talked about? I Forgive me on the pronunciation of this. It's uh, Yes. You're up. And that will be followed by a GR review. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'll start the clock as soon as you tell me you're ready. We're ready. You're ready? You may begin. So we're the Ethical Consulting Board from Dionysian Consulting, and we're here to talk about Prime Air. So 10 years ago, on a 60 Minutes episode, Jeff Bezos unveiled his idea to revolutionize the delivery system as we know it through drone delivery. And Bezos cited his desire to keep Amazon relevant for years to come after his death, and to have drones within the next five years zipping across our city skylines and delivering drones within 30 minutes or less. That has not happened, that was a decade ago, and we want to dive into the issues that are preventing Bezos and his goals to become a reality. This is my friend Isabella. Yeah. So we will be doing an ethical analysis of Amazon's choices regarding the drone delivery program. So um, these issues are in reference to privacy and sustainability in drones. So I will be focusing on privacy for now, and this is an ex extremely important issue that Amazon has to take account of. Um, privacy is an issue that's very inherent to drones and that drones constantly require cameras in order to, in order to function, right? Um, we have AI that needs cameras in order to navigate its surroundings and or in order to make sure that it's even, um, even on the correct path to its delivery site and to make sure that it's not running into, tre into trees, into people. Um, and additionally, with human operators in question, we need cameras even more in order to make sure that this is not happening. This usage of cameras with drones is also useful because it helps Amazon identify if there are people damaging their property, seeing that these drones can cost upwards of hundreds of thousands of dollars. Now, of course, drones are constantly filming everything underneath of them, which means that drones could film the inside of people's yards, and many people could think that this is an infringement of privacy. Now, if we look at Western sentiments regarding privacy, most Western consumers heavily, heavily value privacy despite it being ever shrinking in today's modern world, as we can see with the Congress hearings of TikTok and you can see with the Congress hearings of Facebook. 
um, Amazon as a company needs to refocus its efforts into privacy, considering that this is such a big deal uh, specific to drones. 71% um, of Americans, according to a survey by Morning Consult, stated that they have serious concerns about privacy-related issues with drones, and according to a Pew Research, a, a study by Pew Research Center, 54% of Americans are not comfortable with drones near their homes or their neighborhood parks. Now, let's look at what Amazon has done to address these concerns. And um, if you take a look at their patents, their 64 patents um, issued over the entire course of their drone delivery, drone delivery program, not a single one of them mentions the word privacy, security, and data protection. Additionally, there has been patents, such as one related to the surveillance of homes by Amazon, and another one related to targeted ad system, a targeted ad system based around AI, discovering if there are broken windows, chipped paint, doors, that, could, that Amazon would then send ads about to the consumer that has that chipped paint, doors, and windows. Amazon is not doing a good enough job to address its lack of privacy frameworks and it's even going in the opposite direction and possibly causing Americans and Europeans to become more nervous about their drone program. Sorry. Now, there is not a lack of privacy framework research out there. There, for example, the Vienna Business, the Vienna College of Business and Economics has a framework regarding privacy and drone specifically as well as the London School of Economics. Um, however, Amazon has not come out with their own framework regarding privacy, and Amazon seriously needs to reconsider this. Now let's do a recap. Western consumers heavily value their privacy. Western consumers have had their privacy rights stripped away from them slowly. Amazon has a duty not to continue the stripping away of privacy rights. However, Amazon has not done nearly enough in terms of policy and in terms of framework creation in order to address these privacy issues. Now, I will pass it on to Marcus, who is doing sustainability, um, and this is another part of the ethical issue that Amazon has to face regarding drugs. Thank you, Isabella. Now, we want to make sure that our solution of moving drones out of urban and highly dense suburban areas will not only protect the privacy rights of the people that live in those populated areas, but also is going to be more sustainable than uh, using drones within them. Um, it has become uh, considered that drones are a sustainable method for delivery companies. Uh, they use clean energy and electricity, and their physical parts are much smaller than other delivery vehicles, meaning that they have less physical uh, construction that is required and less emissions in their uh, process. However, this emission saving starts to fall off within, when you examine them within urban settings. Uh, thankfully, Amazon has a ulterior way of moving packages within urban settings, and that is their electric vehicles. Um, a study done by the Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh uh, found that it would take about it would take uh, a electric vehicle moving eight packages per mile travel to be as energy efficient as a drone would in a similar area. Now that by itself might not sound very impressive, but when we do some calculations, we'll find that a average Amazon driver delivers about 180 to 200 packages a day, and the route is about 24 miles a day. And when we finish the calculations, we'll see that 192 packages is the amount that a vehicle would need to deliver to be able to uh, meet that drone expectation, falling within the range of uh, your average Amazon delivery driver. This means that in your average American city, uh, Amazon's drones are going to be less effective than their electric vehicles. And um, we believe that this means Amazon will be meeting UN Sustainability Goals uh, 9 and 12 to improve infrastructure and uh, ensure consumption patterns are sustainable.
uh, advantage that Amazon has by keeping their Amazon delivery drones to rural areas, which is that it would also not cause such a displacement of delivery drivers in, in urban areas. Most delivery drivers operate in suburban and urban contexts. So if Amazon is to move its program to rural areas, not only would this be more efficient regarding drone delivery, uh, regarding energy per drone delivery, um, it would also be far, there would also be far less industry displacement regarding Amazon drivers. So, this, so our solution right now regarding sustainability is to make sure that Amazon does not reach beyond its means in order to, in order to expand into urban and suburban contexts and instead remain in rural contexts. We're just urging Jeff Bezos and the company of Amazon to really walk before they run here. They have a huge innovative technology in drone delivery, but they're over scientific, it's, they're over romanticizing it rather, and for all these reasons that we've mentioned, it's unfeasible to have urbanized deliveries and the goals that they have at the moment. And we should instead redirect all drone deliveries to rural areas for the time being. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. GR and P. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good. Good. Welcome. When you're ready uh, to begin, I'll start. So you're ready? You're ready. Go. Hello, everyone. My name is Andre Benicio, and I'm the CEO of JRP Consulting. I wanted to offer to the UPS Board of Directors a chance to minimize your fueling costs, uh, reach environmental goals, and also minimize your potential liability to recruit employees. Uh, we offer a licensing service with one of our partner companies called Fuel Flame, in which we're able to diversify the types of uh, fuels that your current uh, diesel engine truck uh, uses uh, and for that matter, we mostly change up for um, biofuels, just ethanol, because it's more cost efficient, uh, less pollutant, and overall, after uh, installing our technology, UPS will save around 30% in fueling costs. And uh, it's no, it's no secret that uh, electric vehicles are being over uh, romanticized right now, and uh, it is not an ethical or financially smart decision to do at the moment. And I'll, I'll also like to point out that uh, emission restrictions have, have come a long way and are not uh, getting, are not going to slow down anytime soon. And our company can help UPS be fully compliant with, with those restrictions right now. And um, I also offer one more service, which is to help your company mitigate any potential liability with your, with your employees. Uh, truck drivers are uh, exposed to this particular matter every day. And even short-term exposures can lead to long-term side effects such as cancer and cardiovascular diseases. And um, that being said, a company that has only exposed employees to such conditions uh, will be held liable financially and legally for all, all consequences. And with that being said, if you pass this choose to choose our services, your current uh, gas guzzling uh, trucks will, will be transformed into a more eco-friendly um, uh, machine and also help the uh, decided to move towards a cleaner and more sustainable environment. I'm going to pass it over to my colleague Sydney to talk about the uh, uh, ethics of our presentation. Hello, my name is Sydney Rothka and I'm representing GRP Consulting today. Our goal has always been to provide you with the most financially and environmentally viable solution, which in this case means switching from diesel, which is a fossil fuel made of crude oil and biomass, to ethanol, which is a biofuel made of corn also do other biofuel alternatives besides that. Um, diesel negatively impacts a multitude of things including the health and well-being of society, our environment, and the global climate. Specifically through increased risk of asthma, worsened heart and lung disease, excess production of ground level ozone, reduced visibility because of air pollution, and the creation of acid rain which enters the human food chain through water and produce. Metropolitan areas such as Los Angeles, for example, have a three times higher likelihood than suburbs to see an increase in ER visits and a decrease in productivity. In 2016 alone, there were 21,000 deaths due to fossil fuel, and in 2010, 139 billion was lost through ER visits, hospitalizations, and lost work days. Now I would like to speak on the Democratic Republic of the Congo. 
Going electric means taking advantage of the Congolese people who work for $2 a day as kids and $6 as adults, but there are no other job opportunities available for these people. Now, if you were to imagine yourself in their position or your children, for example, that's obviously not something that we support in America. Um, but American citizen should not be the standard of what a human is. Miners, in a typical day, would hand dig a hole and climb through it for one and a half hours to cut out cobalt, and then climb out in relatively two hours. It's a very hazardous work environment, if you can imagine that. This is to say that it is unethical for the supply chain for UBS, or for ethical or for electric vehicles in general, to have such morally questionable practices when lives should not be considered equivalent to income. All humans are born with inherent right to life, liberty, and security. And when tied to the Dominican Republic of Congo, it is safe to say that cobalt extraction should not violate the rights of workers or local communities. One could logically conclude that stronger labor protections and environmental regulations is the only valid answer in this situation. We as humans are not currently giving our planet the respect that it deserves. Applied to cobalt extraction, it, it requires weighing the benefits of electric vehicles, meaning reducing greenhouse gas emission and air pollution against the negative consequences of mining, which are human rights abuses, labor exploitation, and environmental damage. In our eyes, this is an extremely unnecessary cost with no added benefit to society. Biofuels reduce greenhouse gas up to 65% when fossil fuels are burnt. However, when fossil fuels are burnt, they produce large amounts of greenhouse gases, which trap sunlight and inevitably contribute greatly to global warming. There were 2,000 deaths in the Congo every year in 2020, which is definitely higher now as we go more and more electric. However, unfortunately, 2,000 is only 1% of their 200,000 person workforce in the Congo who risk their lives every year so that way we can drive electric vehicles. Also, UPS owes a legal duty to shareholders when it comes to increasing profit, and they obviously would not want to be involved in an unethical company with such morally questionable practices. Our long-term solution means producing the greatest benefit with the least amount of harm to society, especially during a time when carbon dioxide levels are at an all-time high. It is also an ethical imperative um, that the harm electric vehicles cause is acknowledged and that there are no pros to these goals. I will now turn it over to my colleague, Armin. Thank you again for your time. My name is Armin Kazri. Take a moment and try to put your feet inside of the shoes of the individuals that are mining for materials such as cobalt. It may not seem that it is an important factor or plays a major role in our daily lives, but in fact it does because many electrical vehicles out there, they have a significant amount of cobalt. And although that we feel it is a sustainable manner of living because we're not emitting any fuel or gases, that doesn't seem to be the case. And most importantly for your children, if your children are in the position of mining for these I, mining for these materials, they're ranging between as young as seven years old up to low teenage years. And that significantly affects their health because their body isn't fully developed yet and that causes their lungs to possibly be, be affected. And within a few years of already working, even a few months, they are going to have to stop mining because of the dust that has, they have inhaled throughout time. And even adults, adults throughout the years have developed certain conditions that we don't even know what they have been and we just are discovering new conditions because of these reasons. And being able to understand how individuals' lives are affected in other countries as well as others is extremely crucial. Just because we don't see something happening, it does not mean that it is not happening. And our country values our freedom and we are the land of opportunity, but if we were to hold such actions to be taken in our country such as child labor at a very young age or even adults that their health has been significantly at risk is something we do not support. And going fully electric as of now is not efficient or effective 
but being able to understand the concept of alternating the diesel engine so it can, uh, it can efficiently operate on cost efficient biofuels such as ethanol and other gases is important because we do not fully go electric because we do not want the lives of individuals to be at risk but we are taking that first green step in order to achieving our goal. Although that it is the duty of stakeholders to maximize profits for the company, the value that stockholders and shareholders have within the company is, of course, their investments. They value profit maximization as well, but they also value the reputation that a company holds. While being an extremely big corporation in the nation, while being an extremely big corporation, corporation in the nation, that also leads to many other factors for government officials. If they were to criticize the company, that would lead to those investors wanting to take their investments out and possibly invest it into other firms, which would negatively affect the company's profits, or even they would be operating at a loss. And it is important to understand that it isn't always about self-interest of an individual, but it's rather the greater good of society and the goals that we can achieve in moving one step closer into a sustainable environment. That being said, electric as of now is not a financially or ethically sustainable manner of living. Thank you. Thank you.